and hello one more time. Thanks for joining me again. The objective today is that the second law of thermodynamics has a huge impact on how energy flows through an ecosystem. And that gray wolf you're looking at there is going to be our star today because we're also going to be talking about why keystone species are often found at the top of the food chain. So here we go. A uh, la Cornell, as always, our first question is, so how does energy flow through the ecosystem? And so the thing you need to remember about ecosystems is that there's two major things happening in an ecosystem. The first is that matter is cycling, right? It's going in circles. So carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, all those things are just going in circles. Sometimes it's fast, sometimes it's slow, but the, the stuff is not coming, leaving Earth or coming into Earth, with the exception of, I guess, meteorites and things we blast off into space. But for the most part, it stays here. Uh, energy, on the other hand, is flowing through the ecosystems. And so energy is coming from the sun, 93 million miles away, does a bunch of stuff while it's here, and then it flows back out into space, right? And so, uh, that's a big distinction between cycling and flowing through. Uh, so this begs the question, what is energy? And we're just gonna simply define it as the ability to do work, which is a, a simple definition. So I'm sure a physicist might come up with something a little bit more sophisticated, but that works for us. Uh, and so one, just to complicate it a little bit, E equals MC squared, we recognize that from Einstein and the E. Uh, stands for energy and M is for mass. And so this implies that energy and matter can kind of go back and forth. And so it kind of connects these two concepts there. Uh, just a little side note. So the thermodyna laws of thermodynamics, we've got two, and I'm going to guess that we've heard these before. Uh, we're going to revisit them right now. The first law of thermodynamics is that energy can't be created or destroyed, but we can change forms. So energy is conserved. And so an example of that is, so we've got uh, the light energy coming in from the sun. It uh, made a plant grow, and so that light was converted into chemical energy. Then I ate that plant, and I digested it, and I've tapped into that chemical energy, and I've turned it into mechanical energy, which I've got working my vocal cords right now, uh, which are in turn uh, making little sound waves and vibrating the air that's going into this computer and being uh, turned into electrical energy and it's coming right at you from your computer. And so we're, my point is we're changing energy and each time we change energy, something happens to it, but we can, we can uh, the, the energy is not being destroyed, it's not being created, it's being changed. Okay, and so and that happens, and so here's a little slide for that. So the energy before equals the energy after. So this is a system. It comes in, and then it's, a, it's the same amount leaving the system, but these little stripes there show that the energy has been changed. First law of thermodynamics. But the one that is uh, as important for us, for ecosystems, is the second law of thermodynamics. And what that says is that when energy is being changed, you're losing uh, the vast majority of it is being downgraded into something less useful. Uh, in our case, in most cases, that less useful form is heat. And we know this, like when you drive a car, you feel the hood, the hood's hot, it's because most of the energy that went into that, that was in that gasoline was lost as heat. When you turn in a light bulb, turn on a light bulb, fuel the light bulb, that hot light bulb is the second law of thermodynamics. Okay, and so as energy moves through a system, uh, it is the system moves towards entropy, which is like chaos, and so that energy is downgraded, and we're just going to call it heat. So light comes in from the sun, I wish I had a little sun with a smiley face, comes in, converted to chemical energy, goat eats the tree. I don't know if goats eat trees, but this is, uh, and then the jackal eats the goat. Uh, and as the energy move, moves through the system, it's lost. Here's the thing you need to know about food webs. I'm sure we're familiar with them, but for AP purposes, if you ever need to reconstruct a food web, make sure you put little arrows on your lines and the, the arrows basically follow the energy through the system. Um, this really should have some arrows uh, showing how energy is leaving the system. Here, let's go on to a more realistic food web, uh, which is going to be a little bit more complicated. And so if you remember from the last lecture, the, uh, the more links in the food web, the more complex it is. Typically, it means it's more stable. And so it's really an argument for biodiversity and why biodiversity is good for an ecosystem. And so uh, it'll be able to be more resilient. There's a natural disaster, and somehow that fish disappears for a while. The whole system doesn't collapse because there's alternative pathways for that energy to flow. And so again, energy is flowing, but this is kind of a misleading diagram because it makes it look like the energy is kind of just all stuck here. What we're missing is the energy coming out. 
And so that's what I'm going to show you right now. Uh, we're here at the energy pyramid part of the little lecture. And so uh, I would definitely draw this picture to scale the best you can. Um, I wish I had a little sun again. You can put a little sun there with a smiley face. We've got light coming in from 93 million miles away. Uh, and it hits the producers, anything that can do photosynthesis. And what this box represents, and this is something you want to get, is it represents, for, for our case, it represents all the chemical energy at the producer level. And so we're just going to put a number on it just so we can like watch how the numbers break down. But let's, uh, we're going to say it's 10,000 kilocalories. Uh, and note that a million kilocalories of sunlight came in. Only 1% of that got tapped uh, by the plants and converted. But now we've got the 10,000 kilocalories here, and we're going to call this the rule of 10 because what happens is every time you go up, so here we got the producers, so we go to the primary consumers like the bugs and the cows and the, the basically the herbivores. They're going to be feeding off this la layer, but and I, I wish I had a pen. You, you have a pen. Draw a little squiggly line like that with an arrow and write 90% lost. 90% loss at each trophic level. And so only to, so it was 10,000 kilocalories. Now there's only 1,000 kilocalories available for the next level up. And so now the secondary consumers, uh, the, the carnivores, are feeding off that layer, or that, uh, the, the herbivores, and note it goes from 1,000 to 100. This is our rule of 10. So 10%, 1%, and then 0.1%. So th th this is the reason why we don't have very many top consumers. So it goes primary, secondary, tertiary. What's the fourth one? Quad, quattro? I don't know, something. But there's, there's really no fourth level because there's not enough chemical energy here to support that fourth level. And so, again, every spot, you're losing the majority of the energy to spend outer space as it goes up the ladder and then also you got to uh, you know remember that snakes doing stuff as it eats the food it's not you know it's breathing and moving and using energy there too uh, and so uh, we're gonna wrap this up but just one thing to think about is that this has got pretty big consequences for humans we're trying to feed seven billion people and we can just think about what we eat here in Northern California we've got a pretty you know we're, we're typically feeding like right here as we eat you know typically a lot of meat things like that and so when you do that you've got to have lots of plants to feed those cows or chickens or whatever and so what that requires especially with a, an expl you know growing population is you've got to convert more uh, land, more habitat into farmland to grow the grains to feed those animals that we think we need to eat. Uh, and so it, it really becomes a resource issue and it's one we need to take a look at. Okay, so we're going to cut it right there, come right back. We've got two case studies involving the gray wolf. Actually, both of them involve the gray wolf, so you can't miss out on that. But please come back here in a second, but we're going to cut this first one off there. Uh, and I'll see you in a sec.